Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself an idol. I want to talk about the idolatry of sex. The idolatry of sex and God's view of sex versus Satan's view. So let's turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Colossians over in the New Testament, and you'll find middle of it after Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, okay? Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. So immorality, impurity, or what we would call lust, amounts to or is the same as idolatry. So it's breaking the first two commandments. Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> Romans is right after Acts. Since you're in Acts 2, you ought to know where Acts 1 is. And then Romans 1. Beginning at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Every time you commit sin, you suppress the truth. That means you put it down. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Everyone knows there's a God deep down in their heart. <clears throat> for since the creation of the world is in visible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their futile heart was darkened. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling things. The Bible says in Psalms, any man that says in his heart there is no God is a fool. And so when you shut out God, you become a fool. You are foolish. And instead of worshiping the cre Creator, you worship the creature. Notice what it says. Verse 24, Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. These might be dishonored among them, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. And then it talks about uh, homosexuality, lesbianism. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned their natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons, or in another translation, the personality, in their own personality, the due penalty of their error. In other words, it starts changing your personality, and that's when you start seeing the certain uh, personality traits of homosexuality. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. That's a very crooked, corrupt, impure mind. To do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, 
inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they do not they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. And then in Romans chapter five, uh, chapter eight rather, verse five and six, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is <clears throat> life and peace. And Romans 6:16, 6, the last one. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? There's a saying that if you think a thought, then you reap a choice. When you make a choice, you uh, reap an act. When you create an act, you reap a habit. And when you've established the habit, you create your destiny. In other words, it all starts with the thought. It's in the thought world that uh, you create your idols. And an idol is anything that takes the place of God. And so today I want to talk about this whole area of the idolatry of sex and what it does in actually destroying even the virtue and the value and the very fulfillment that God desired when he created sex. And so as we talk about it, I want to list three words that are in the Bible and uh, we'll see if you know these words. Since they're in the Bible on three or four occasions, I'm sure you all know this word. Lasciviousness and what it means. The second word is concupiscence. And the third word is defrauding. Now, you all know those words, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, they're there in the Bible, so let's, uh, let's see what the Bible says about them. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 5, lasciviousness is mentioned along with other places, but let me give you a definition for this word. Very simple. Lasciviousness is to concentrate on something to stir up the sex drive. I'll repeat it so you can write it down. Lasciviousness is to concentrate on something to stir up the sex drive outside of God's limits. Outside of God's limits. To concentrate on something to stir up the sex drive outside God's limits. Second, concupiscence. <clears throat> A continuing, strong, abnormal sex drive. Concupiscence. A continuing, strong, abnormal sex drive. A continuing, strong, abnormal. Now the word abnormal is a very important one. Abnormal sex drive. The third is defrauding. Defrauding. Defrauding is to willfully arouse sexual desires. To willfully arouse sexual desires in another person. To willfully arouse sexual desires in another person that cannot be righteously satisfied. I'll start over. Defrauding. To willfully arouse check sexual desires in another person that cannot be 
righteously satisfied. Last time, defrauding. To willfully arouse sexual desires in another person that cannot be righteously satisfied. You'll find this in Romans 7, 8, 1 Corinthians 6, 8, 1 Thessalonians 4, 6. Romans 7, 8. 1 Corinthians 6, 8 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 6. Now, let's talk about love. Love. Let me give you a definition of love. Love is to will the highest good for God, others, and yourself. To will the highest good for God, others, and yourself. Uh, think of those words very carefully. The highest good. To choose the highest good for God, others, and for yourself. The Bible says in Mark chapter 12, at verse 30 and 31, that you're to love God. The first commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The other is to love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say love your neighbor not yourself, but love your neighbor as yourself. And if you will the highest good for yourself, that's true love for yourself. To destroy yourself, of course, is hating yourself. And so we want to understand what real love is according to the Word of God. Uh, a girl wrote in to Ann Landers and she said, Ann, you're old fashioned. And uh, because she was talking about the virtues of relationship and love and so on. And she said, I've had uh, 35 boyfriends since the first of the year and I've, I've kissed them all. And Ann wrote back, Dear kissed, a lemon squeezed too often becomes garbage. There's an idea in the world, you down. And, uh, and in fact, I want to make a real bigoted statement. That is, sex was not created by this generation. And it wasn't discovered for the first time by this generation. Now, some of you doubt that. But I think that there is proof that other generations also knew about sex. <laughs> but there is a possibility of destroying the value of sex. I want to tell you something else. Sex was created by a holy, wonderful, loving God. Sex was created by God, not Satan. Now the whole idea of sex was God's idea. And just like everything that God has created that has been good, Satan would like to twist it in order to destroy you with it. But when you understand that God is the author or the creator of sex, then you also understand that he is the one that prescribes the use of it for the maximum fulfillment, for the maximum purpose. And so as we talk about love, I want to relate the subject of sex and love together because I believe that's the way God intended it. Animals are animals, but people are to be people. And that which is true love always includes respect, Reason, restraint, responsibility. You can never have true love without respect, reason, restraint, and responsibility. Who do you think the most exciting personality is in the universe? Who do you think wants you to think he's the most exciting personality in the universe. 
Satan. And uh, we're going to deal with some of the, the issues here between God and Satan that we have to choose. But in terms of true love, God has the best in mind for everyone here and everyone in the world. He's got the best idea. He's the creator God. The other one's the destroyer. Now, anything that's true love is a triangle. Now, you say, well, wait a minute. I thought love couldn't be a triangle. That'll wreck it. No, it is a triangle. But God is at the top of the triangle. The only way you can really love is because he first loved. And anything that really is love will always include the highest good. And so it's got to include God in it or it won't be true love. Now, man and woman were made for each other and man is one side of the triangle, woman is the other. And one, um, the woman is to be the spiritual inspiration or the spiritual influence. Man is to be the spiritual authority. This does not mean that woman does not have authority or man does not have influence. But the one who has the greater, according to the word of God, is that man is to have the greater authority, woman is to have the greater influence. Now, which is most important? You can't say which is most important. It's like saying which is most important, man or woman. Try to do a generation without them and you won't have any the next generation of either kind. So we, we need each other. And uh, the woman helps to mold the thinking of the, the child more, but the man gives the commandment more. And when that's in balance, it's a beautiful balance. Right now there's a big struggle on in the, in the world whether the woman can have uh, equality with man or not. Well, the woman already has equality. God's made all of us equal. He made us in his image. This is according to Genesis chapter 1, verse 25, 26, and 27. We are made in the image of God, male and female made he them, the Bible says. And so we are absolutely equal. But this whole idea of equality, they're mixing up with uh, the idea of equality, authority, and function. Let's face it, gals. You'll never have the function of men. And face it, men, you'll have, never have the function of women. And the idea is, is to accept who you are and enjoy it to the fullest because equality has nothing to do with diversity of, of function. Nor does it really have to do with the greater authority or the greater influence. Because if you have to choose between the two, you simply will function better as God will show you uh, who you are. And so, whether it's influence or, or authority, it's a trade-off. It's just, whether it's man or woman, it's, they are both equal. And so, God has called the woman to be the greater spiritual influence within a relationship. The man to be the greater spiritual authority. But both are based on truth. When you are committed to truth, that's called responsibility. Responsibility is at the foundation of every single relationship in the world. Every friendship in the world is based on responsibility. And you do not have a friend that's any better than your commitment to that friend and that friend's commitment to you. Take, for example, two thieves. They can be the best of friends in all the world. It's no problem. As long as they are responsible to that friendship. That means they have to be truthful in their friend, friendship or their commitment to their friendship even to the point of view that both being thieves, they don't steal from each other. Now you think that's true. They, the, the saying is there is honor among thieves because the minute a mafia guy starts to steal from another mafia guy, what happens? <laughs> the friendship breaks, right? And so they have to commit to truth and are responsible to it only in a limited degree. Therefore, they're against everybody else, but they have to be for each other. Now, every friendship is like that. Now, you can also see it among murderers. Two murderers can be friends, but if one ever murders the other, that friendship is over. <laughs> 
See, we can all see that one. But that's true for every kind of friendship. The man that cheats on his wife is really cheating on himself because his relationship is no more fulfilling than he is faithful or committed or responsible to that relationship. And so these guys that think they're getting away with something actually are losing all that they really are intended to have. That's true in every single friendship. So you have no better friend than you are committed to truth and responsibility to that friendship. You think about your close friends and those are the ones you are committed to to do that which is honest toward them. And if you don't do that, then you're a very lonely, cut off person in the world today. Now, what God intends, what He wants, is that we be responsible and committed to truth in all of our relationships and think what a friendly world this would really be. You talk about aloha spirit, it would really be aloha. It would be the kind of love that God desires and the kind we will have in heaven where everyone is because they're committed to Jesus who is truth. Now, whenever you're committed to truth, your movement is always toward God. That means the closer you get to God, the closer you come to one another. That's why truth, see, is a triangle, uh, love is a triangle. Because the more you really move toward a person, you have to move toward truth to do that. But to move toward truth, you move toward God. And finally, God wants you to be closest of all. That's why a true Christian marriage has the potential of being the best relationship on earth. In the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, in the Trinity, those three personalities have the closest unity in the universe. But the closest unity on earth was decided or desired by God to be between man and wife. Because you can know a relationship that is closer than any other possible relationship on earth, any human relationship. Now, if you move away from truth, you naturally move away from God, but you also move away from each other. The so-called open marriages, the kind of thing where you do whatever you want to, I'll do whatever I want to, is no commitment at all. It's ultimate loneliness and merely using each other physically from time to time. And it is not a true relationship. It's not true love, it's lust. And in order to get into one of those uh, traps of lust, it's simply moving away from truth, moving away from God. And when you do, you will create an idol in your mind. In the American public, they have created idolatry, an idolatrous form, in the area of sex, in the whole Playboy philosophy. It is built up, and here's the concept. The concept is, is you build it up, and the idea of having sex with more people, it brings you more fulfillment, is everywhere preached as, as a concept. And the idea of lust, is lifted up and people are giving their minds to it so that they just sim simply think about it, are consumed with it, and become a part of it. Now, this is easy to figure out if you just sit back and reason. Say, well, if, if sex with the most people bring the most fulfillment, the most fulfilled, happy uh, person on earth, the one that's really got it together is a prostitute. And you start saying, wait a minute, that's not true. They don't have self-respect. They don't, they use themselves. They take the money. That's what it's all about and so on. And there's no fulfillment at all because there's no relationship. Now, if you're going to have relationship, then you can only have it on the basis of responsibility and love. It's like trying to say, well, I, I'm a sober drunk. You can't be both. You can't have love and you can't have uh, irresponsibility at the same time to relationships. They go together. True love, true fulfillment comes with true responsibility. And there's no shortcuts because it's all built within your personality, within the laws of nature and the laws of social dynamics. God created us that way. 
it's also built there in the the natural laws that are involved with sex. Now, how can you know if you are in love? Everybody wants to be in love? Well, how can you know when you're really in love? Some of you are going to someday be picking life's partners. And uh, since you're going to be married someday, maybe not all of you, but most of you, have you ever thought of it this way, that the one you're going to marry is alive somewhere in the world right now? You say, I sure hope so. <laughs> You're robbing the cradle otherwise. Well, how are you preparing for that person? Are you praying for them? I don't mean praying for them. <laughs> But I mean praying on behalf of them that God will begin moving and preparing them for you right now. How would you want them to prepare for you? Are you preparing for them in the same way? That's what responsibility is about. That's what relationship is. And if you are not committing yourself to being a responsible person to be that responsible husband or wife in the future, then... How in the name of fairness and justice can you expect them to be preparing themselves for you? And how could you honestly pray for that? You see, it's quite a question, isn't it? Honesty and commitment is always two ways. And so you need to begin right now preparing you for them and praying for them to be prepared for you. And it's a, it's a beautiful understanding that God can bridge that gap between you even now. And then at the right time, bring you together. But how can you really know if you're in love? How can you really know? In 1 Samuel 13, speaks of the story of Amnon and Tamar, where Amnon could not wait, and he wanted Tamar physically and sexually, and the story shows that when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin brings forth death. Several people died out of the result of that story. Ultimately, the kingdom of David was overthrown because of it, because he did not uh, correct the, the sin of fornication in that case, and that which followed, murder, and strife, and he lost his kingdom over it. It's a very complex but interesting story to follow through how lust brings forth death and really thousands died as a result of just the enemy planting that, that uh, strife and, and uh, sin of lust in, into the uh, royal family. So we need to know what real love is. Here's a way you can tell if you're in love. If you're in love, you can list five things, five ways in which you're helping the other person spiritually. You can also list five ways that you are helping them in their personality growth and development. That is, their mental and emotional growth and stability. You can list five ways if you really love them. You can list five ways that you are helping and not hindering them physically. Now, if you can't list five ways in each one of those categories, you don't love that person you may be using them, though. Now, why? What is love? Give me the definition of love. Okay, now, if you're choosing the highest good for the other person, then you're choosing the highest good for them spiritually. And obviously, if you love a person, you're going to be helping them if you've chosen to help them or to the highest good for them spiritually. You would obviously be doing things to help them mentally and emotionally in their stability and growth if you love them because you're choosing the highest good for them in that category. The same would be true physically. So anyone that you do something to that destroys them or tears them down in any one of those areas, you don't love them, you use them. That's selfishness, not love. It's the opposite. It's the counterfeit. And the counterfeit is not only not real, it is 
it is deceptive because it pretends to be what it is not. So let's see why. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. That's in the Paul's letters. 5.23 of 1 Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be presented complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, spirit, soul, and body, three areas. So I'm going to put a little diagram here of what I'll call the triple trinity of man. The spirit, the soul, and the body. Now let's, uh, let's talk about these three and what that entails. The spirit, the soul, and the body. The spirit has first the ability of worship. The Bible says those that worship must do so in spirit and in truth. Can you worship in your spirit something other than God? Is there a possibility? I hear yes, I hear no. Are we indecisive? Well, yes and no. Which is it? Can you worship something else other than God with your spirit? Okay. <clears throat> now, let me add a word to that. Can you worship God without worshiping in truth? Can you worship God without worshiping in spirit? Okay, so to worship God, you have to do so in spirit and in truth. But can you worship something else in only spirit but not truth? Yes? What's an occult experience? Idolatry. You become involved in your spirit in idolatrous relationships. In idolatry. You become involved in your spirit. We're going to see that sexually you become involved even spiritually in bondage through immoral sexual experiences. We'll see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 a little later on. And you actually can worship other spirits, including Satan, but you can't worship him in truth. But with God, you worship him in spirit and in truth. So all human beings have the ability of spiritual worship, some with false gods, but those in truth with the true God. Now, can you communicate with spirits? Is there a spiritual communication? Okay, that's what happens at a seance, for example. You can sit there and some guy comes and says, I'm your Uncle Joe. Well, he's lying to you. He's a demon. But he is telling you that that's who he is because the devil lies. That's, he's the father of all lies. And the demons lie because they're under their father, the devil. And so at a seance, they will even mimic the voice of your uncle and convince you that he's come back from the dead to talk to you. Now, anything he says is obviously going to lead you astray, ultimately. And they may use a little bit of truth in order to trap you, but it's possible to communicate with spirits. God is a spirit. Can you communicate with God? and he can communicate with us. So this is knowing God's voice, knowing spiritual communication from God, whether it's audible or whether it's any other way that he speaks, that's up to him, not you. But God can speak to man and man to God. That's what prayer, true prayer, is all about. It's two-way communication. And God has given you the capabilities. Now many times we, we become deadened in those areas. And that's why the Bible speaks of spiritual death. We become spiritually dead to the ability to perceive and communicate with God because we're not committed to truth. And anytime we're committed to error, it brings death into our life. 
That's why Romans uh, chapter 8 is saying, when you set your mind on truth and on the Spirit, it brings life. But if you, you set it on the flesh, it brings death. So anything that you do away from God, away from truth, brings a spiritual deadness. Now, when you really come alive is when you're spiritually alive. And that's what life's all about, because you get to enjoy all the full dimensions of spirit, soul, and body. Now, the third part of the spirit is what I would call the conscience. And this is mentioned in Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 where it shows that the conscience and the moral law are two separate functions of your spirit. For example, the moral law is that which is written on your heart where you know something is right and you know something is wrong. The right and wrong. Everybody knows this, but it can be refined to varying degrees. So that even a murderer knows it's right not to kill and wrong to kill. However, his conscience appeared. That means it's like the mirror of your mind. You look into the mirror and you see your actions in the light of the moral law. And you, you say, hey, that's wrong. That, that, that hurts my conscience to do that. I can't do that. It's against my conscience. Because you, are, you're, you have a sensitive conscience. But if you keep breaking the moral law, your conscience becomes seared. It's like the fogging of a mirror. You can no longer see your own actions in the light of what is right and wrong. So a murderer can go along with no conscience in, at all and kill people right, left, and center. It doesn't matter. But he knows it's wrong when you start to kill him. He can see your actions in the light of right and wrong, but he can't see his own. This is why they judge others, and they don't think anything about the fact that others can also see they are doing wrong. And this is a very important area in your life to make sure that your conscience is always clear because you'll never be able to be really sensitive to relationships. If you have a bad conscience, you will have a whole dead side of you and your relationships will not be sharp and quick and powerful and, and real dynamic and exciting at the level that it, it's most meaningful. Now. If you have two people wanting to come together, the key to a real good marriage, the best in the world, and why shouldn't you have the best? Why shouldn't you have the very best relationship that God planned for you to have? The only reason you won't is your own choices when they're made in the wrong direction. So you can have the best marriage possible for you to ever have if you go God's way. Now here's the way to test it. The first is the spirit. Now notice the Bible puts them in this order. He doesn't say soul, spirit, body. He doesn't say body, spirit, soul. He says spirit, soul, and body. That's the God's way. So are you compatible with that other person spiritually? It's like three areas of life compatible with the other person are you compatible spiritually now how do you find out can you both worship God together and do you worship God together because you worship God together and there's no strain between you there is a relationship level spiritually that is far beyond what any sinner can ever know. And a couple that cannot worship God together is a couple that is not quite complete. This is why the Bible says don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That means you're not to marry an unbeliever. Now the Bible also warns that those have, that have gone ahead and made that mistake don't now break up. But uh, understand that you have missed out on a certain part and you have to pray for the other person to become a believer. But you're missing the best if you ever marry an unbeliever. You will miss the best, God's best for your life. And God has someone that's best and you are just simply because of unbelief that they won't come along at the right time and place, you go out and make your own decision. And you really miss the best that God has. So, 
Are, can you worship God together? Can you seek God together to know His will? That is, do you pray to hear the voice of God, to understand what you're to do in certain circumstances and so on? My wife and I, as we have prayed through the years like this, we find that it's, it's really fabulous where we will ask the Lord the same question and time and time and time again we get the same answers. Now what this does, it, it just makes us closer and closer to each other and to God. And it just enhances our relationship. Uh, one time we were giving in an offering in Switzerland and uh, we have the pattern that uh, in, in the offering time we ask the Lord what we're to give. And I turned to Darlene and I says, what did the Lord say? And she said, well, 400. And I said, oh, oh the Lord told me 100. And there was something wrong here. We we're getting two different voices, I thought. And I said, wait a minute, did, God, did you ask God in, French, in Swiss francs or dollars? She says, in francs. We were living in Switzerland. Oh, I said, I asked the Lord in dollars. And 400 francs at that time were worth $100. And so we had gotten the same answer, but we just asked it in different, in different uh, money, in different currency. But out of those kinds of experiences, it actually makes you closer to one another because you are spiritually compatible. Now, the same thing is true with your conscience. If one has a bad conscience, that is, they're, they're covering over a whole lot of garbage and they don't tell the other about it. And the other is open and transparent. There is not the complete compatibility there should be. You've heard it said that what you don't know doesn't hurt you. But it really does. Because you really know beneath the surface in your subconscious mind. You, you know there's a certain barrier there. I talked to a young man that had been married, uh, oh, perhaps a couple of years, and he was concerned about certain aspects of his marriage. And I said, have you ever been totally truthful to your wife about everything you've ever done that was immoral, even prior to your marriage? Oh, he said, no, I was told never to do that. I said, well, let me ask you a question. When you talk with your wife on certain subjects, do you find that as you approach a certain subject that you either can't talk about it because of your own guilt in an area, or you have to start deceiving her in that area? He says, yeah. You see, the only way to have a more complete relationship is to be totally committed to truth, even in the area of your conscience. And my wife and I decided years ago that we would have no secrets whatsoever from one another. Not that we can just simply talk about everything each one does always, but <coughs> in the area of our life, there are no areas that we're not able and have not told about anything that is of a conscience nature. We have no secrets whatsoever. If you will set that as a goal, for your life and for the person you're going to marry to be totally honest with them. Do this before you're married. Just simply at the time when you realize this is the one and, and this person realizes you're the one, say, we need to have an honesty session and I need to share with you anything that I've, I have done that would mar our relationship at a later time in any way. You say, well, I might lose them. It's better to lose them then than later. Because you won't scar them up later in the, in the breakup and all the hurt and all that will go on. But if you are willing to be totally transparent, Jesus was totally transparent. They called him guileless. That's the word in the New Testament. Guileless. It's like a child that's open-faced, like the little boy I told you that the artist took a picture of and called it heaven, because his face was just open. He had no secrets. He had nothing to hide. And if you will simply be that kind of a person, it'll bring health to you. Turn to chapter 5 of James, for example. This is not on because not too many people want to do this. But... 
it says in chapter 5, James, verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. The whole idea here is if you have a clear conscience, you will be a healthier person, even physically, because you, you cannot... percent plus and uh, he thinks above 80 percent of his patients that came for physical reasons actually had spiritual mental and emotional problems and that if he could solve those then their physical symptoms went away well think how this relates to relationship if you have an area in which you are hiding Anyone who is open and transparent is more sensitive, and they're going to sense that. They may never say it, but they sense there's a barrier there. There's an area that they never talk about. If they start to talk about it, then you rebuff them, and you never talk about it again. So there's a whole area of your life where you're not compatible. Now, if God wants your relationship to be most like the Trinity, you think that God in the Trinity is hiding something? You know, the Holy Spirit's hiding something from Jesus? Of course not. They have absolute openness and sharing. And because of that openness and sharing, of course, they have infinite minds and can understand everything and know it all. But you can also share in your spirit and in your willingness everything. And in that kind of openness, you can have a very sensitive, close relationship that the guy with a hard heart, hard conscience, he doesn't even know anything about it. He blusters on, and he doesn't know what it's like to have that sensitivity and that uh, real close relationship. He's hardened himself. 
and as a result that outward hard shell cannot be penetrated therefore he cannot enjoy the kind of compatibility that God wants him to enjoy he thinks he's one because he's done all of these big things you really can't do wrong and get by you can't sin without reaping and you're going to reap in your own personality and you're going to reap in your own relationships. So everything you do right builds toward a beautiful relationship. Everything you do wrong builds away from it. So the second area is the soul. Spirit is first, soul is second. The soul is the intellect, the will, and the emotions. That's what we call the personality, the psyche, your psychological makeup. Now, if you're going to be compatible with a person, you need to be compatible intellectually with them if you're really going to enjoy that relationship. My wife is my best earthly friend. I enjoy being with her. I just like to talk. and. We just talk about all the things that we're both interested in and uh, I can sit by the hours and talk with her and enjoy that. Have for 17 years. And uh, in this relationship, I believe that God wants you to have the kind of relationship where it's not one person that's intellectually up here and the other person intellectually down here and you never talk to each other. And therefore, you have to go out with the boys and she has to go out with the girls and in order to have fulfillment. Now, it's okay to have other friends. That's, that's right, and God wants that. But if your closest person to you is not your closest friend, you, you don't have the kind of marriage that you could have. So, most of you being single, in fact, I think all of you here, is that right? Oh, sorry, Frank. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sorry. I'm sorry for them. <laughs> Yeah, and Kevin, excuse me. But in your, your future, you can have the kind of relationship God intends. You haven't blown it yet. So make the right choices, and you'll have the right results. So think the right thoughts, and then you'll have the right choices. So begin right now. And you've seen those that you know at, at the final touchdown of the season the football hero goes out and he catches the pass and goes over and makes the touchdown and everybody's cheering and the moment of high uh, emotional hilarity and all the girl who was the cheerleader is is all thrilled and they go out and they decide to get married that next week and they go off and live happily ever after of course can you imagine 10 years later him still talking about that touchdown pass I mean, there's a point where you say, hey, forget it. <laughs> it really wasn't that important. It seemed like it emotionally at the time. But there's something more important than your last touchdown pass. But intellectually, you will grow together you, as you both individually grow and you grow together if you are intellectually compatible. Now, you see how the, Satan would twist this all around? He would say, start physically. And you'll never find out if you're spiritually compatible. You'll never find out if you're intellectually compatible. You'll get all involved physically and emotionally, and you think, well, my, this is going to be it. And it's not. And yet you're involved. So go God's way. Get the right order, the right sequence. Now, the second part is your will. That's where you make choices. That's what we call values. Values. And in your values, that includes such things as food, dress, and a whole lot of areas. The will of God for you is a part of your value system. Uh, some think like, well, you know, doesn't matter if our values are different. Let me say this, and we're in a 
a culturally blended society, especially here in Hawaii, that I think is, in, is really enriched because of the many cultures. In the Bible, there's nothing against the different cultures and races marrying, intermarrying. There's nothing against that. The Bible doesn't in any way say that. And all races are equal in God's sight. So as we understand that, and there's that total blending. By the way, there's, there, there is that teaching that says that the black man was cursed of God. The Bible does not say that. And in chapter 11 and 12, you'll find that that's, that's the case in Genesis. Uh, it's not talking about the black man. It's talking about the Canaanites who were destroyed later. They were the Hivites, the Sinites, the Jebusites, and all of those. They were destroyed. And uh, I believe the sin was homosexuality that destroyed them as a culture and a, a people. And I think that that really could have been the sin that brought the curse in the first place. But anyway, it had nothing to do with race. Nothing at all. Now, in the light of this, there is still another aspect that you need to carefully consider that is not racial, but it is cultural, and that is values. If you're raised on mom's cooking, don't expect whoever your wife is, guys, to cook just like your mom does. There's going to be a difference. But the time to settle those differences and understand them not after you're married. So, what do you do? If you cannot be free in each other's homes prior to marriage, there's something not quite as good as it could be. You say, but my mother and dad don't approve of them. Well, it's important to find out why. Because your mother and dad have been around you a long time and love you. Why wouldn't they want the best for you? Now, it may be prejudices and so on that they'll have to get over. We'll get them over ahead of time, not after marriage. In other words, <clears throat> learn to, to be at home in the home of your future wife or your future husband and vice versa. And if you can't be at home, let me tell you something, guys. If you really want to know what she's going to look like a few years later... Go, go to her home about 6 a.m. and see how her mother looks. <laughs> Somebody's groaning too loud back there. Get you in trouble. Do you want to know, girls, what he's going to be like and what he's going to treat you like? See how his dad treats his mother and see how he treats his mother and his sisters. He's not going to treat you any differently after about six months of marriage. Now, he can grow, he can change by the grace of God. But if he doesn't choose to, that's the way you're going to be. That's the way you're going to be treated. Now, you can find these things out ahead of time, but don't be blind by emotion. Now, emotion's a very real part of love, but so is your value. <laughs> Your, are, so are your values. You see, if your values are, are, are similar, then the compatibility will be greater. So put everything on your side in marriage and don't go out and try to be the hero and marry the one that needs the help the most because that's not the basis of marriage. If you get the right person, then you can help many people. And fellows, some of you guys are going to be leaders for God someday. Let me tell you something. That in, among the leaders in the world today, not just in spiritual leadership, but in presidents, presidencies, in generals, among the uh, military, uh, in leadership in business, in every category, only the minority don't have good marriages. The majority of good leaders have good marriages and they work as a team, never as an individual. I say never. There are some exceptions, but they are rare exceptions. If you are going to be a real leader, then you better get a wife who also has that kind of compatibility with you and she enjoys the things you enjoy or you will not rise to the kind of leadership 
that you are capable of rising to, whether in business, in society, in the spiritual realm, whatever it is. You get that one that can rise to the leadership uh, levels and understandings and so on. Can you talk with them over those areas? Do you have the same values? Otherwise, you end up, some person has the value of, I want to save money because they are security conscious. The other one that says, I like to spend money. Now, if those two get together, you've got problems. You see? One saves it, the other spends it, and pretty soon they have conflict over money. Or just simply the will of God in the area of values. If you're called to India and she's called to Africa, you've got a geographical problem. <laughs> now, the third area of the soul or the personality are the emotions. Now, the emotions bring color and dimension to life. And they're not bad. They're just simply not to guide you. They're, you're to enjoy them, but they are not to control you. To live for your, your emotions is sin, ultimately, because it will destroy you. In other words, it's like trying to get a higher high each time on drugs. Pretty soon, you're going to kill yourself. You'll take an overdose. Because... You can't take the same amount of drugs all the time and get the same high. You have to each time step it up. Now, this is, this is true in any realm of your emotions. That if you live for your emotions, you have to somehow do something more to get a higher high and eventually you burn out. God wants, because He created your emotions... He wants you to have sensitive emotions that you can have that freedom of laughter, freedom of enjoyment, also sadness, sorrow, grief, all the ramifications of the emotions. He wants you to enjoy them all and or feel them all because in contrast, it will bring to you a full colorful life. There are even shadows. when In a painting, if you see a beautiful painting, there will be shadows in that painting. And there will be shadows in your life, and they don't feel good at the time, but it's a part of your character growth and makeup that you need even those uh, downer emotions. But if you live in the area of love solely for emotions, you've got problems because you can't get a higher high of emotions. See, as you think it through, you know that... That's the case. If you live it out in the opposite of reason, then that's not real love anyway. You're only talking about fantasy. Now, let's uh, illustrate this. You come to Makapala. Why do you come? Because it's a Christian retreat place where everyone is just seeking God and you've come only to seek God, right? Right. <laughs> Now you wouldn't come for such a thing just to look around at, you know, to find a boyfriend or girlfriend, would you? Of course not. But sometimes some people do it like this. They come to a, you know, a conference and a lot of young people are there. And, and like a submarine, they send up their little scope, you know, and they start looking around. And the speaker's speaking about something from the Bible and they're going, you know, and they're all looking around. And... Uh, here, here's the gal, and she sends up her little scope, and they're looking around, and suddenly they see each other. And then birds start singing, bells ringing, and, whoo, and it's love at first sight. Now, if you really analyze it, what is it? Here's someone looking for somebody and looking for acceptance. And all the time he's had a dream girl in his mind and she's had Mr. Special in her mind. And if that person that they've had in their mind is non-existent, because that's the way it is, it's imaginary, it's an imaginary person that they've created. It's usually, for this kind of shallow thinking, is someone with certain physical uh, attractiveness and qualifications. And so they are seeing somebody, though, that is accepting them emotionally because they're looking for someone, they're looking for someone, and just the fact that they're each looking for something is a common ground to start with. So they all feel like, ooh, this is it. And uh, they haven't really uh, 
known the person. But after testing the relationship out for three days, they go away and get married. <laughs> and as the story ends, they live happily ever after. Don't you believe it? There are the exceptions where people actually made commitments on such shallow knowledge lucked out. But let me tell you, with every exception, there are not, you know, for every uh, 100, there's 99 that didn't make it that way. Here's the way it goes. After a few, few weeks of marriage, over the breakfast table, he looks at her and says, why do you always fix your hair that way? Well, a few weeks later, she's not even going to fix it at all, maybe. But he's looking and saying, why are you fixing your hair that way? She says, oh, this is the way it was when we met. Don't you remember? I know, I don't like it that way. Why do you wear that dress? That's the one I had on. I know, but I've seen it every day since. It's the only one I've got. Why don't you get a better job? And here they go trying to change each other. And then she says to him, why do you always pick your teeth like that? And now they're picking at each other. And little by little, what's happening as they start nagging one another? What they are realizing is, I thought I was marrying my dream person. The truth is, the dream person is only imaginary, fantasy. This is a real person. And I have married a real person. And I don't like what I'm married because they're not like my dream person. So I'm going to remake them into my dream person. And the other person feels that rejection. And they start sensing you really don't like them. You want them to be somebody else that doesn't even exist. And they start feeling rejection. So they reject back and pretty soon that coldness is felt. And pretty soon they're fighting. And the very one they thought they loved so dearly, they consider a millstone around their neck and they have bound them by chains, as it were, to keep them from the person that they think exists out there somewhere. And they've actually created a fantasy and married reality and they're trying to create reality back into a fantasy. It's one of the most mixed up situations and yet there are millions of marriages just like that that I'm describing right now. They don't, you don't have to have that kind of marriage. You really don't. If you will choose right, and if you'll make the right choices, then you will go in the right way and not start with emotion. Or worse yet, start with the physical. Now the physical, the body is the bone, the flesh, the blood. Or in doctor's terms, the endoderm, the ectoderm, and the mesoderm. But it's a triple trinity anyway. Now Satan would have you with the idea of a idolatry of sex. We're talking about the first two commandments here. That in the idolatrous view of sex in America today is the way to really find happiness if you would believe the playboy philosophy concepts that are perpetrated on society. If you would believe that, that the way to find fulfillment all has to do with emotion and the physical. That's where it's all at. And yet, where is there evidence of that anywhere on earth other than in the mind, other than fantasy? And if it is fantasy, then you don't even have to live outside the mind to have what they're talking about because it's a lie in the first place. That's what fantasy is. It's a lie. It doesn't exist. It's really sad. Did you know that <clears throat> the main sex organ in your body is your brain? You think that through. That's where 90% of sex takes place. I saw on Johnny Carson once, they had a, what they called a, a sex symbol on some real deeply thinking, intellectual, blonde, <laughs> whipped out onto the stage. And uh, 
just the kind that you'd you'd think, my, that's that's a person you could be compatible with forever. Just sit down and talk by the hour, conversation, of course. <laughs> hey, by the way, I was told once that uh, uh, if you're going to choose just on the physical, you better choose the voice because you hear 90% more than what you see after you marry. So it's a it's quite a thought. If you get a person with, rah, 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 you know, that kind of voice that grates you all the time, it, <laughs> Uh, it's better not to get, you know, even if she looks beautiful, it's better to get one that looks bad. You can always turn the light out, you know. <laughs> but you can't necessarily turn her off. So that's, that's a little side, uh, that's for nothing. But Johnny Carson asked this girl, she, he says, uh, what do you think about being America's sex symbol? Oh, she says, I guess every man needs a sex symbol. And I got to thinking about why she would say that. I, I don't believe that. I don't believe it's right. I believe that God intends, and this is according to the Bible in Proverbs chapter 5, that your wife is to be your sex symbol. You don't need a national sex symbol. But if you don't have a compatible relationship and you're having a fantasy relationship, then men married to their wives, having sexual intercourse with their wives, can be having a fantasy relationship with a sex symbol. And that's not marriage at all. That's not what God intends. God wants you to enjoy each other to the fullest. Now, if you are compatible spiritually, that means you can worship God together, and you do, and you communicate with God in spirit, even together, and you have a clear conscience before one another, intellectually, you're compatible, you're the best of friends, can talk together in any area, and love doing so. You have the same values, and then emotionally of course you can let yourself enjoy each other in the in one another's presence and uh, and laugh together cry together whatever but in marriage this is where god wants in marriage the two to become one flesh that's simply not a separate experience but it's the culmination of the total experience and that's where in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Bible is so practical. It teaches every area of our lives, but it speaks there. <clears throat> Don't you know in verse 9 that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, fooled, neither fornicators. This is 1 Corinthians 6, 9. <clears throat> fornicators, neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, verse 1 Corinthians 6, verse 16. Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a harlot, that means have has sexual intercourse with a harlot, becomes one body with her? For he says, God says, the two will become one flesh. Now it goes on and adds another dimension to this. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now go back to my triangle. Love is a triangle. The woman and the man, as they get closer to God, can come closer to one another. The same is true here. Flee in immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside his body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body. So what God is saying here is there is a spiritual dimension that is hindered by immorality. In fact, I believe, and I've seen the evidences of this, that as you join yourself in immorality, you open yourself to an evil spirit at the same time. And that evil spirit is that 
that bondage that comes on you, that spiritual bondage to hold you in that spirit of lust, which is a form of idolatry according to Colossians 3, 5, as we read. This is the same as idolatry. Immoral thinking, immoral practice is the same as idolatry. And so idolatry is that which takes over your spirit, soul, and body eventually, and you cannot in the flesh move into immorality without it, ex it, it affecting you, and we know this in our mind. For example, our intellect is made up of our ability to reason, our conscious awareness, our memory, and our imagination. Now, in those, those areas, once you have cr committed an immoral, immoral act in your body, you have memory to work against you for a long time to come. And so, with that, you have actually tainted or poisoned your memory. How do you get free again? I believe it's important that whenever you confess your sin, that you confess the specific sins in detail with God. And at times, God will have you humble yourself before others as well. And in that, don't be general. God, you know the sin that I committed. Of course he does, but remember, sin comes out the mouth by confession. When you confess your sins, be specific and you'll get specific freedom. Generalities, you can never answer. You know, I, I listen to people generalize all the time about certain things. And they'll say, the Democrats are, the Republicans are. That's ridiculous. That's a meaningless statement. The Baptists are, the Catholics are, the whatever. Everyone is unique under God. Now, Satan comes along and generalizes and says, you're horrible, you've blown it all. But you can't answer that, so you just feel bad. That's called condemnation. The Holy Spirit comes along and he doesn't say, you're horrible, you've blown it all. He says, you're wonderful, but you're wrecking it in the following ways. You did this, you told a lie to this person, and you told a lie to that person, and more than that, you were ungrateful. Three things. And you can say, God, forgive me for that lie, and that lie, I'll go and make it right. God, forgive me for lack of gratitude, I'll go and become thankful. And so, you can, then you're clear. You see, it's specific. Anything general, toss it out. Specifics, take care of it. Because that's where freedom lies. Now, when you confess your sin specifically, you name the person before God. God, you know that person. I sin with, I am sorry, I reject it, I renounce it, and I break that spiritual bondage in Jesus' name. You can't break it, but Jesus can. And in His name you can by the Holy Spirit. And so, as especially you have someone to agree with you, touching that, that is broken. And when it is broken, then the memory starts to fade into a normal level. It doesn't mean that you can't recall it, but it's not always glaring like neon signs on you. And it's an important thing to do because 1 Corinthians 6 shows us there is a spiritual wedding with God that truth allows to continue unbroken, but the joining in immorality destroys that and there becomes a spiritual bondage that there takes in your life you are taken over by a spiritual bondage and so you must break that and that, that's very important now what satan would like you to do is just turn this upside down and he would say start physically and emotionally and you'll have a great life god says no i want you to be preserved sound and blameless to the coming of our Lord in your spirit, soul, and body. Keep the right sequence. Now, what happens if you don't? Let's. Here's the three. Here's the spiritual, here's the psychological, and here's the physical. The first step down always comes in the mind. Now, it comes in what the Bible calls lasciviousness. You begin to think on something to stir up the sex drive 
outside of God's limits. For example, you go to a dirty movie or read a dirty magazine and you are implanting in your mind thoughts that were not there before and these thoughts begin to stir up your sex drive. But you use it. See, the first thought that comes to you is not your fault. That's temptation. You just simply reject it and it goes. But if you choose to keep that thought, that's sin. And then it becomes lust. Now, as you make that choice to stir up something, to think on something, to stir up the sex drive, as you begin to think that way, the next thing that will happen is what the Bible calls concupiscence. Concupiscence is what? A continuing strong abnormal sex appetite. Now, your main sex organ is your mind. Okay, you give your mind to idolatrous thoughts. That is, things outside of God's limits of love. God's laws are merely limits of love. He limits you so that you won't destroy yourself. Now, as those limitations are broken by your choice, then it begins to affect your physical being, your glandular system. And as the, the thoughts continue, then it becomes a physical habit. You don't start physical habits outside of the mind. That's where they, they first get their inroads in the mind. Then they take hold of the body. By this time, then you give yourself the excuse, because you have to justify what you do even though you know it's wrong. You have to explain even to yourself well, I can't help myself because I have a stronger sex drive than most. How did you get it? Well, you don't want to blame yourself, so you say, well, I guess I was born with it. You know, it's like I was born with a drug habit. Well, the truth of the matter is, is you chose. You think a thought, you get a choice. You, you make the choice, you get an act. You continue in the act, you make a habit. Continue in the habit to reap a de destiny. So concupiscence then leads to perversion. Perversion is the misuse of anything that's good. You misuse it for a wrong purpose. Now, along the line here, to enter into defrauding, which is to try to arouse in others an unrighteous uh, sexual drive that cannot be righteously satisfied. So, <coughs> perversion is the misuse of, of the gift of God that God has given us called sex, and we pervert that which is good. In that perversion, it then becomes a part of you and a part of your yourself in such a way that uh, it affects every part of your being spirit, soul, and body. You cannot have sex just in the physical. It affects every part of your being. Because God wanted it to be the culmination of two coming together in a beautiful way that will grow in its fulfillment. And when a wife and husband comes together, see, there is not only the, the immediate sexual fulfillment, but there is that mental, emotional, and spiritual fulfillment when it's done in God's way, within God's limits in marriage. But it also, out of that love relationship, produces children that come out of love and out of that kind of environment of acceptance and that modeling which can lead them into a whole beautiful realm of life. But if that's broken down in any way, you can be the beginning of a new generation and a new future. You can start, even if your parents didn't have this kind of life, you can have it. 
with God nothing's impossible. He desires for you to have that which you have been created to enjoy. You're wonderful as you were originally intended by God and you can become all that God wants including a wonderful marriage. But you can't do it breaking His laws. Now if you've broken them let me just say that God has a way out. He can take a lemon and make a lemonade. He knows how to take ashes and bring beauty out of it. It all starts by confession. You confess your sins. That means you, you actually you say that was wrong. Now you're taking sides with God against your past actions. In other words, you're putting distance between you and your own actions by saying, I did wrong. You humble yourself by saying, I did wrong. And I've broken your laws. And more than that, it's become idolatrous because my mind is polluted by it. But I want to cut that off, God. That's what you're saying when you truly repent. I want to change. Now, you make the choice. He gives the grace to do it. Because you're going to need grace. And the grace of God is that enablement. He enables you to do that which you choose that is in His will. And so you've got to trust Him. And you ask Him to forgive you so that the guilt can be removed. So you don't go around with that heavy load always. And you allow that guilt to be removed. As you, for, you receive His forgiveness by faith through Jesus Christ. Then you tell him that you will make right any wrongs, which includes restitution with the person that you have sinned with. Now this is a very important bulwark uh, for anyone that you have sinned with because when you renounce that kind of relationship, you are strengthening your stand against future temptation. So if you say to that fellow or that girl, I'm really sorry I treated you wrongly and I sinned against God and against you and I'm sorry. It's a real humbling that will give you real freedom because they will recognize, yes, it was wrong whether they react that way or not. They will know that's right and they will also recognize that you're committed to truth. This also allows Satan and all the powers of darkness to recognize that you're committed to truth now. And it's going to be harder for him to tempt you the next time because of the price that you paid and the, and the great clarity with which you have made your decisions. Now, in this whole area, be very careful when there are other relationships involved and only do this in God's timing and God's ways. But if you will be thorough, like the thief that is repented of stealing takes back that which he has stolen, like Zacchaeus. If you, who have hurt relationships and have sinned against others, will make that kind of restitution, you will find a freedom that no psychiatrist can give you no amount of money, no escaping can give you, no drug trip can give you, no alcohol escape can give you, you will find a kind of relief and a release that only God can give you. And God will do it as you are committed to truth. And truth demands choices that are right. What God really wants for every one of you. He wants you to have the kind of marriage, the kind of life that is the best. And the only way you can get to it by His road. His road is narrow and straight. But ultimately, it's true fulfillment. That doesn't mean you don't have fun in sin. The Bible says the pleasures are of, of sin are for a season. It just means that there are four seasons and you're going to wreck three-fourths of your life in the life of sin. But if you will go the right way, you will have four-fourths of your life and you will enjoy every stage of your life and each stage that you come to gets a little better in refinements in nuances as the French would say in the ways of real in-depth fulfillment 
and it becomes deeper and deeper in its fulfillment. And the shallowness of the past is something that you just simply would not trade for the depth of the moment as you grow in God and grow in your relationships with one another. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, I, I pray and ask you for the real fulfillment and relationship that you desire for each one of these young people. Jesus, you died for that so that they could overcome the enemy and all of his temptations, his traps that he would set. And yet we know, Lord, that you also leave the final choice to them. That's an awesome responsibility, but, Lord, that choice actually decides our destiny. And that ability to choose is something that sets us apart from animals and machines. And we don't want to lose that ability to choose. We would never be a robot, and yet, Lord, we can choose our own destruction. I pray, God, that the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit to their minds will be so sharp that they will see the truth and choose it because it's right, not because it feels good. And I pray that as they choose right over feelings, then I know that you will in allow them to enjoy their feelings in the right perspective all their lives. And I thank you, God, for your goodness to us. In Christ's name. Now, Lord, convict sin. And I pray, God, that each person here will, will feel that conviction, condemnation of Satan, but the conviction of the Holy Spirit that will show them where they went wrong, what they did, and what they can do about it. In Christ's name, amen.